with the blessings of his holiness shri shri ravi shankar guruji on this national sports day 29th of august 2020 we are blessed to have with us pulela gopichand ji who is the chief national badminton coach of the indian badminton has been taking it to great heights who is born to win and lead the man behind indian badminton he'll be throwing more light on the topic physical fitness enhances emotional fitness before i proceed i'd like to thank and welcome our um, ssrvm trust chairman shri uh, harsha ji who is uh, commodore harsha ji who is the chairman of our shri shri ravi shankar vidya mandir trust i would also like to thank mrs rajita bagga ji who is the trustee and president of shri shri university ms jaina desai ji who is the trustee of shri shri ravi shankar vidya mandir thank to ms rama venkatesh ji who is the head academic council of shri shri ravi shankar vidya mandir trust and all the academic council members i would also like to welcome our students parents and staff of shri shri ravi shankar vidya mandir our ved vidyan mahavidya peet schools and shri shri university students parents and staff welcome to you for this beautiful session on physical fitness enhances emotional fitness it's my honor and privilege to extend a warm welcome as well as to mention a few of the vast achievements of pulela gopichand ji as i welcome him to this session pulela gopichand ji was born on november 1973 he did his schooling in hyderabad and graduated in public administration he was the captain of the indian combined universities badminton team in 1990 and 1991 childhood and early life he was interested in sports from a young age as a little boy he used to play cricket and took up badminton at the age of 11 in 1991 he was selected for his state junior badminton team pulela gopichand ji won the junior national championship at the age of 18 as he began to enjoy success as a player he realized the importance of receiving professional training and so moved to bangalore he made a remarkable win in his first national badminton championship title in 1996 and went on to win the title five times in a row until 2000 in 1996 he also won a gold medal in the sark badminton tournament and defended the crown next year too Gopichand ji carried Indian badminton to great heights at the 1998 Commonwealth Games. His good form helped him win two gold medals and one silver medal at the Indian National Games held at Imphal in 1998. The same year, he won a silver medal in the team event and a bronze medal in men's singles at the 1998 Commonwealth Games. His streak of success continued over the ensuing years and he won the Open Championship in France and the Scottish Open Championship in Scotland in 1999. The same year also saw him emerge victorious at the Asian Satellite Tournament held at Hyderabad. He reached the peak of his career in 2001 when he won the prestigious All England Open Badminton Championship at birmingham he beat the then world number 1 peter gade in the semi finals and proceeded to defeat sainas shane hong in the final match to lift the trophy it's uh, great reading this itself i'm feeling so i have goose pimples all over me great hats off to you and uh, wonderful tenji i'm really so uh thrilled that on national sports day i'm getting to read great achievements moving on to the awards that he has won he won the arjuna award in 1999 and the rajiv gandhi khel ratna award in 2001 in recognition of his sporting achievements 
the government of india bestowed upon him the padma shri in 2005 gopi chanji received the award as the then president apj abdul kalam he also is the recipient of the dronacharya award for outstanding coaches in sports and games from the then president pratibha devi singh patil who presented the award in 2009 in a glittering ceremony bhavan in new delhi he was also awarded with the padma bhushan india's third highest civilian award in 2014 he was bestowed upon an honorary doctorate by iit kanpur pulela gopichand ji has been given an honorable mention at the international olympic committee's coaches lifetime achievement awards in 2019 after winning the England badminton championship in 2001 Gopi Chand ji has been renowned for coaching major badminton stars in the country he founded the Gopi Chand badminton academy to impart world class training to emerging indian badminton athletes several youngsters who received training at the academy went on to achieve international fame these include saina nehwal parupalli kashyap pv sindhu and kidambi shrikant to name a few at present gopichand badminton academy is known as one of the best training institute gopichand serves at his best at the academy to inspire and lead the players their worth with a racket and indeed the whole nation has faith in his coaching instinct after all the man has carved the badminton legends of the nation uplifting the stature of the sport in india Gopi Chand ji has been a great support always to Shri Shri Ravi Shankar Vidya Mandir schools and to the trust. And whenever I've asked him, you know, we need this for the school or could you address, he's always saying, uh, you know, being so humble and immediate to respond, saying anything for our school. It really touches me to see his simplicity and the humility that he carries in spite of such great achievements. Thank you, Gopi Chand ji. One of the secrets <laughs> for the champion's success is Pulela Gopi Chand ji is a known practitioner of the art of living techniques. Gopi Chand ji believes that very significant changes have taken place in his life since his association with the art of living. He is an ardent follower of Gurudev Sri Sri Ravi Shankar ji and reinforces art of living foundation's mantra live in the present moment. Gopi Chand ji thank you for accepting and being here with us to throw more light on the importance of sports and that too on a national sports day so welcome to you and thank you for being with us over to you thank you thank you reshma ji uh, for the kind words um, and uh, to all of you present here uh, wish you all a very happy national sports day i think um it's really wonderful today that um all of the trust and the members and students are present here to talk about sport i will just share some of my own thoughts on my own journey of sport something happened in 2015 uh, which really changed a lot in my perception to sport i always thought that sport was very important for pride for winning medals and all of those but for me this incident in 2015 changed many things I was coaching this girl in April 2015 where I normally don't coach many very young beginners but this being a summer camp and I had time in the afternoon so I was coaching kids and um, a particular girl who was about 13 years old little plumpish um I was throwing shuttle so the exercise was to actually catch the shuttle and throw it back 
unfortunately she didn't catch the shuttle and i was a little annoyed i said be attentive and i threw another one and she didn't catch the other shuttle as well i walked out on her and started focusing on the others saying that you need to better focus she came up after the class and she asked me saying sir teach me how to catch and that particular incidents changed my entire perception of sport and what i want to speak to be, today is about that if alphabets word sentences in some sequence was an alphabetical literacy and if numbers addition subtractions multiplications divisions in some sequence was numerical literacy and if crawling walking running throwing jumping in some sequence was physical literacy in the last 30 years as a country we have grown up alphabetically and numerically but we have actually gone down physically and why this happens started to bother me and i soon thought or realized that when we were young there was nature to take care of us physically we would have time we would have a puddle a tree to teach us how to jump how to climb how to throw but today there are many kids especially in urban and not only urban but now i see it in rural as well who are not able to do simple fundamental things and the more i saw the more i realized that suddenly i was able to notice kids who couldn't run backwards who couldn't do simple splits who couldn't throw and catch freely and that started to bother me and i started to look at why this happens and it's obvious and simple that our move away from nature has caused us to actually lose physically so in this journey of physical literacy when i look at my own self and sport because for me i've played sport from 85 literally each and every day of my life and i only thought that it was very very important that sport produces champions so i lived my life in that sense to keep pushing myself to higher and higher goals and i also have as a coach looked at kids and said where is the talent for me to keep pushing them so that we start winning at higher and higher levels so when i had 10 kids i would see who in the 10 had the potential to be the best and that is what i started pushing so for me as players i would not bother about the rest of them but look at the potential and keep pushing them and after this incident i started looking at each and every kid and said this is really not nice because if kids can't do these basic things they will never be able to enjoy sport in their entire life and i started to reflect on my own journey in sport my own journey in school because when i was a kid and especially after i came back to hyderabad i lived my life because my father was working in a bank we would get transferred every 3 years i spent the initial years in orissa then another 3 years in chennai then i spent 3 years in coastal andhra 
And then when I was about 10, I came to Hyderabad. When I came to Hyderabad and I started playing badminton, so I would go to school and I was the favorite of some teachers, English teachers, social teachers, because I was, I studied in Chennai, my English was better. And um, I was bad in certain subjects because the change of syllabus in various states made me very poor in certain subjects. But I was really good in sport. So I was the favorite of my PE teacher and the school principals. So there were many times in class where I would go to a maths class or a physics class and I wouldn't understand the head or tail of what was happening because the last few days I had missed school because I went to participate in a tournament. So there were many times where I ended up kneeling down outside the class or had to stand out on the bench because I didn't understand or answer something. And on the microphone in the school, there would be applause for me where they would say the entire school should stand up to clap for him because he's won something big. So that is how childhood was. So after a point when I also did my 10th, 11th, 11th and 12th in maths, physics and chemistry, and I didn't get into engineering. I got into um, socials or public administration, economics, and uh, political science. Even till date, when you talk of subjects like maths, physics, chemistry, I said, I don't want to do this. If I take the same example to my PE class, I would remember, recollect that there were many kids who didn't enjoy the class because there were about five or six of us who were good in sport and we were doing all the playing and they were at literally standing out in the class. If we were to play football, we wouldn't pass the ball to them. If we were to play cricket, we would be doing the balling, batting and the fielding and they would be pushed to some place in the ground where they can hide. So much of sport was to the physically more endowed. And I would see and recollect how each one of them have seen themselves and said, sport is not for us. And the same feeling I have about certain subjects, I believe that they have about physical activity and sport. So today when I look at it, if, and I started, and this incident in 2015 started me to look at sport differently. I said, and they would say, talk about sports builds confidence. And I said, yes, if you're winning, it does build confidence. But I wasn't sure about the people who are losing out and being thrown out of sport, whether it builds confidence for them. And I started to question that concept. Then there was another thing about team spirit. Yes, it is great when your sacrifice or your contribution makes the team win. That's great team spirit. But if you ultimately have to sacrifice your slot in the team to ensure that the team wins, that is the sacrifice, which is a true sacrifice. And I've seen that that sacrifice doesn't happen in sport so much because you see a lot of athletes in sport who have to be thrown out of sport, literally, because they're not ready to sacrifice themselves for the team's good. And this happens among very great sports persons as well. We only have to look at history of many players to realize that this actually happens. And this also means that the people who were in sport wanted to win at all costs. You have doping, you have cheating. If you're running, then somebody would obstruct your way because they want to win at all costs. So sport 
is having these issues is what I could recognize. Team spirit, sacrifice, confidence. But then I was looking at sport a little more deeper. And for me, that journey was very interesting because think of it that how many times in a class do or any subjects make us understand about life skills as much as sport does. A simple thing like free play where a kid goes out and plays and learns. Just free play. Leave kids. So it's like I remember how we used to go down to the apartment. We would go and talk to kids and ask them to come, let's play. And we four of them, five of us, ten of us. So your team building, your communications, and then you adaptability because you adapt to or you learn to take other people's inputs. Because today somebody wants to play marble, somebody wants to play cricket somebody wants to play football, your own ability to actually compromise, to work with the team is developed by this element. You make two people as leaders, you make a set of rules and actually follow those rules. This is where your working with the team grows, your leadership grows, your skills grow. If you're in a football team or if you're in a cricket team or if you're playing any sport, if you don't pass the ball to somebody within few days, you will be very unpopular and people would actually throw you out. So you learn to share in sport. There's so much of pressure because you look at the team expects you to score those runs or those goals and that pressure which you feel or that loss which makes the team lose and your mindset to cope up with that actually makes you stronger for life. And that is what sport gives. And the other aspect and a crucial element of learning which we tend to ignore, forget, in, in present day, nobody taught us how to play cricket. Nobody taught us how to play football. We just watched and learned. To watch, to emulate, imitate, to have role models is something which even free, unstructured sport teaches us. So today when I look at sport and its value, I believe it is very, very important. But a fundamental shift in our mindset towards sport needs to be there. Especially in schools, especially with kids. It is important that we need to recognize the fact that sport is not for the physically endowed. It is not for the people who are born Athletically, it is for everyone. For the longest period of time, when we thought sport, we thought the top five in class so that we can win at an inter-school, inter-college. And if our school has 10 good sports persons who win medals in the inter-school, and if we, if we, go in and win those tournaments, we thought that we are a very sporting school. But that notion has to change. It is not the how many play sport, but literally how many don't play sport is what really matters. For us, I think that is the shift we need to really look at. We need to look at ensuring that the last five kids in the class are 
having a positive experience in sport. And that for me is the shift which I'm talking about. It is not how good you are in comparison, but how good you are against yourself. So for me, if a kid cannot even explore the boundaries of his physical being, how can he be a visionary? If a kid cannot throw the ball as high as it can go, as far as it can go, if he cannot jump as high as he can or run as far as he can or run as fast as he can, how can he even be a visionary on the mental side? And for that reason, we need to play sport. Sport is not only for medals. The pitch is that sport is beyond medals. Sport is not for the select few. The benefits are of sport are for everyone. And that is the reason I believe we need to invest in sport. We need to invest in sport so that each kid blossoms to the fullest of his physical ability. And that is something which each kid or we as a society, we as parents, we as teachers, we as leaders need to ensure that each kid blossoms to the best of his physical potential. And that's something which is supremely important. So when I talk here, I'm talking about sport beyond medals. I'm talking about sport for everyone, not for a select few. I am pitching for just sport for itself, not for anything else. I don't know. And I think I don't know truly how many subjects I have learned in school or we've been taught in school are useful for life, but truly a good foundation in Physical literacy is definitely useful for life, surely. For me, I think this aspect of sport, where we talk about sport for everyone, has everybody in school support is important. And the success of our physical education program or our foundation in schooling is when 30 years from now, each of these kids go on to enjoy physical activity for life. Physical literacy is a term which was coined because when I was in 2015, I went back and I kept searching and researching about this because this started to bother me. Because if I had 10 kids of my own and if one was a champion and if nine were losers, would I be truly happy? And that was one question which started to bother me. And with that single question, I went deeper into it. So physical literacy is a word which is coined by this British scholar, Margaret Whitehead, that was also somewhere in 2014. So it's a new concept because people have realized it's almost like in academics, slowly people are talking about different streams. People are talking about each kid blossoming in different areas, wherever he can be good. It's a similar subject. I have gone to classes, I've gone to lectures and said sport is different from education because you, if you are weak in class, academics teaches you special classes. But in sport, if you're good in sport, then academics teaches you. But I think today, especially for schools and for parents, it's very important that we need to have a foundation which ensures that they will enjoy physical activity for life. And it's not competing against somebody, 
it is actually being the best of what you can be and that is what is very very important i think um this is one side of the story um i was struggling on how i could marry both because on one side i was wanting sport for everyone and on the other side i also realized that a medal in rio or a medal in london especially the one in rio where we were as a nation starving for medals and sindhu's medal actually showed me what pride and happiness it can give to the nation and as our prime minister had said for a nation for a society for a community to actually progress pride is very very important and each of these wins add to the bucket of pride which is so important for us to grow forward so sport competitively has a great value so when i was struggling with these i had a certain answer from a quote of jrd tata years ago half a century ago in fact or even more i think 1955 quote which actually said that a nation doesn't become great by re- removing poverty it actually it becomes great when you give an opportunity for its best to shine forward and become the best in the world i think that is what i will stop at wherein physical literacy for everyone where each kid each person in society has access and has the society support to make the kid physically literate and if you have the talent and the inclination an opportunity for you to ensure that you blossom to be the best in the world i think this is very very important i'll stop here i'm happy to take any questions about my own playing days and also my coaching career and on any other aspects but before i stop um i think uh, for all of us um my association with guruji goes back to almost 1995 96 where i had an injury then i was reading through some books about yoga and meditation because i had a surgery on my knee and um, my good friend from hyderabad ravi kumar he actually introduced me introduced me to art of living and um, from then on whenever i was in bangalore every saturday sunday i used to spend at the ashram and it's really amazing because um, when i came back in 2017 and this idea was still only in my head and i came back and guruji spoke so clearly on the same subject which i was in our sports conference that it amazed me that his knowledge and his understanding of things was so deep i think it just reiterates the point um of where and how lucky we all are i'll stop it at here um to take questions and uh, we'll be happy to spend more time thank you wow that was so good hearing you can go on and on so inspiring to see understand about your journey so much to learn every word that you have mentioned every sentence and of course i think your journey your association with the art of living and the world 
We definitely have a lot of questions pouring in since the time we have announced this, that we are having a session to you. Students, parents are so eager to know more about you and understand more from you. So I request your uh, Vrindaji to ask uh, the questions that have been, we have received. Yeah, thank you, Reshma ma'am. Uh, so thanks a lot. Uh, it was really a very, very inspirational speech. I wish it could go on. Uh, but the there are many questions, as Reshma ma'am rightly pointed out. Uh, I would start with the first question. The question is, sir, in what way your life has changed after becoming a coach? Um, for me, um, uh, my own journey in sport was very uh, different. It's not that I was supposed to be a player or something. I was playing um, cricket uh, and I broke a few window panes in uh, around 84, 85. And my mother uh, got some complaints from the neighbors. And uh, luckily, we were staying close to the stadium. So mother took me to join uh, cricket because I was uh, super excited and I loved cricket and uh, went to the stadium. Uh, but cricket's admissions were closed. They didn't, uh, they had too much rush after 83 World Cup. I think everybody wanted to play cricket. So, and there was only one stadium and I didn't have anybody to recommend for me. So, we, uh, I, I missed out on cricket and then I missed, uh, then the next sport which we or anybody knew at that point of time was um, uh, tennis. Uh, but parents decided against tennis because they saw too many cars parked outside. So then we went to the badminton court literally because it was empty. And uh, that's how my journey started. So not that I was, um, um, well, I ch chose badminton or something, but I chose, uh, I loved sport. And uh, for me, my mother realized that if I had too much of energy, I was running around all the time when I was young. So my mom uh, would keep conditions. If you study loudly from 4.30 in the morning till 5.30, I'll send you to the stadium. So I was like uh, religiously get up and uh, study for one hour loudly so that she could hear in the bedroom. And um, after an hour, I would run to the stadium. So that is how my childhood uh, was. But uh, luckily for me, I had a coach called Hamid Hussain, sir. And this, this journey is uh, interesting because today when I look back, um, I, I just felt um, God designed, destined for this to happen. Because uh, my first coach was Hamid Hussain, sir. And um, he didn't teach me in a literal sense how to hold the racket or hit a toss. That I learned by watching others. But he taught me how to love the sport. And that was very important. So as a childhood coach, as a coach for a beginner, I think it really doesn't matter how you play. And that is what I learned from my coach, Hamid Hussain, sir. And today when I coach kids also, it's the same principle. Since first, let them come. So we can't teach them till they love it. And many of these things, they will learn by themselves. So I think the love for the sport is something which was taught by my first coach, Hamid Hussain, sir. When I loved the sport, then I was lucky that I had a coach called Arif Sir, who taught me all about discipline and hard work. And um, after this, I had a coach. I had Prakash Sir as my coach. I was in Bangalore. For all of us, between 1980 and 90, badminton had really gone down. And we didn't think that we would ever be champions in the sport or we can achieve what Prakash sir had achieved. He was almost like God. But he actually inspired and showed that he can actually, we can actually emulate what he has done. That's what I learned from Prakash sir. And my final coach was Ganguly Prasad, whom we worked together as a team. And I also had two foreign coaches, one Chinese coach when I was playing in Germany and one Chinese coach who had come to India for a short stint. So in my entire life, I had various coaches. I learned a lot from trial and error. And by the end of my career, which had 
a knee surgery in 94, 96, and 98. Um, I learned a lot about myself, about nutrition, about techniques, tactics, and a lot of trial and error. I, I figured that I had the formula which was there to win. But uh, in 2001 end and 2002, I had another surgery on my right knee. This was an overuse injury. And basically, it meant that the formula I couldn't use. And... Um, I found young kids around whom I was experimenting this formula on. So it's almost like I knew what it is required to win at the highest level, but I didn't have the body to use it. So I found kids around and I started coaching. So in 2003, we started coaching unofficially. And in 2004, started coaching on an everyday basis. And that is how this transition from player to coach actually happened. And um, for me, it is just that I had the formula. I didn't have a body to use it. And let me find kids who can actually use it. So the first group of kids in 2004, the oldest was Kashyap, who, who won the Commonwealth Games in 2014. And uh, there were players like Guru, who was about 11. Uh, Saina was about 13. Uh, Sai Pranit was 11. And uh, Sikki, Sumit, they were about 11, 12. And Sain, Sindhu was the youngest of that group at nine. So I think um, that's how uh, my transition from a player to a coach uh, happened. Thank you, sir. The next question is, uh, who is your role model? Um, for me, I was very lucky that... Um, I have, of course, Prakash sir, whom somebody we all looked up to, look up to, as somebody who's definitely there. But uh, for me, I also had a lot of inspiration from people around me. My parents, who worked relentlessly without taking a break for years and years and years, are great role models for me. And also people around me who are competing may not have been the biggest names, but these people actually who are around me and who would try to push hard and be the best of what they can be were great role models for me. So I actually didn't, I was lucky that I didn't need to go anywhere beyond my immediate vicinity to find role models and motivation. And that was uh, very good for me in my journey. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, how do you fix your goals before playing your match? I think uh, the whole process of goal is something which I learned the hard way because uh, for me, whenever, and, and I spent a lot of time injured. In 94, I was playing with my partner. I was the best singles player in the country. I was playing, I was supposed to play the finals of the national games and I was playing doubles with my partner. I and my partner collided. He landed on my leg. And I broke the anterior cruciate ligament of my left knee. And um, this was, what, um, 25 years ago. At that time, neither did we have the knowledge or probably the expertise. And not many or not anybody had ever recovered from an injury of that nature to play top-level badminton again. But luckily, I had a doctor called Ashok Raj Gopal in Delhi who was there because I also, it happened destiny that my father was posted there. So I went to him, he did the surgery and it took me a year to come back from that surgery. But again, after a year in 96, again, I got injured, had to go back for another surgery on the same leg. And again, I came back, beat a few, um, beat the Olympic champion of 92, beat the Olympic champion of 96. And when things were looking good, had another fall and another surgery in 96. So luckily, sorry, 98. So between 94 and 98, I had three knee surgeries back to back on the same knee. But luckily between 98 to 2001, I didn't have many injuries. And that's when I got the best uh, medals or the best performances. But what it taught me that every time I would write down goals, those goals went for a toss. 
I would write them down a short term goal, medium term, and I get an injury, and then both the goals went back. So finally, it dawned to me that every day is important. If my left knee was hurting, I would train the other parts of the body, and if my whole body was all right, I would play. So it soon became known, or I figured out, or today when I look back at that journey, I believe. or i know that it's important that the process becomes your goal and you shouldn't really think of the goal too much if the process is your goal then the goals will take care of themselves because if i had written a goal or a dream when i was younger i don't think i would have dreamt or had a goal this far so for me when you stick to the process and becoming better at the process the goal takes care of itself and that is what i felt has been one of the greatest learnings in my own life in journey thank you uh, the next question is what is the role of diet that you would suggest in being a successful sports person supremely important diet training and rest so if you need to be good good training good rest good thoughts and good intake of food i think these are very very important um so what is good might differ from people to people but i do believe that to incorporate a lot of um live foods to eat a lot of vegetables and fruits is very important if kids can be given raw milk it is good and uh, i think the rest we can debate but i think these things along with good sunlight and um sleep and thinking are critical for being a good athlete or a good person who is blossoming to so don't think of yourself um everybody should think of themselves as an athlete because if you need to be a good athlete you need to take care of your body and that needs discipline if you need to take care of um if you need to have performance you need to take care of your thoughts so when whatever field you are in whatever you choose whether you are in academics also if you eat um foods lo- loaded with carbs and sugar you're going to not be mentally functioning to the best of your ability so it's like not like sp- sports it's not that sports persons eat, need to eat right it's like everybody needs to eat right because i have experimented with different foods and realize that for us to be sharper food plays a critical role so i think it's very very important that we incorporate foods which are live and we need to knock out processed foods completely thank you uh, the next question is how do you correlate uh, strategizing uh, as a player and as a coach what are your suggestions on implementing them in teaching oh. i think um the stu the coach has to go to the level of the student the student cannot raise to the level of the coach i think um when i am an athlete um, my life is very very nice very simple because every decision which i make is made against a particular question and which is is it good for my sport and whether it's like i you have to go out you ask whether it's good for your sport you want to eat something you ask whether it's good for your sport you want to think or do something it's simple because you're asking this against only one question and that is is it good for my sport so life of a sports person is very very focused as a coach i think it's exactly the reverse you ask the same question what is good for the student 
and whatever is good needs to be done from my end and that is something which i think could help thank you the next question is how how would you balance success and defeat although reshma ji has read a long list of achievements um i've failed more and i've seen more failure than success we all see the 10 victories or the one student who has won at the olympics but there are 10 others who went to the olympics and each loss hurts so when i was at the olympics in rio my thoughts that night when everybody was celebrating were also about the sub junior kids at the academy who who i needed to focus on so i think in this journey of sport in my own journey i think if i were to rejoice celebrate at success and go down at failure then it will be an emotional turmoil for me so i think to just step back a little bit from success and failure is very very important and um em- emotionally as a coach i have must have lost some thousands of matches so if each match i am emotionally depressed for a long time then it will be mentally i just go mad so i think it's very important to let go of each of them you can't let go of failure alone if you get too elated by success i think it's for that reason you have to let go of success as well and just forget about each of them and focus on the process um, thank you uh, the next question is what advice would you give to a youngster who is keen on badminton I think love the sport. Um, give it all you have, and um, and for all of us also, I think it's it's strange, but um, it is a paradox. I think when I'm playing sport, the only reason I believe I was successful is that I didn't think of failure. or i didn't know of anything else and i didn't have a fall back strategy so i just wanted to win and i gave it all i had so to jump you cannot have one leg here and one leg there you need to dive and that's important it's for parents it's for teachers and people around to ensure that there is a safety net but as an athlete i think give it all you have is what i would say yes the safety net should be ensured by the people around supporting but as an athlete you are and you have to believe that you will be the best in the world and till the time you have um energy you should give all those energies and all the focus to ensure that you achieve your goal thank you uh, the next question is how to practice and ensure physical fitness during this pandemic times i think today um you can just open youtube and there are tons of exercises which are available whether it's yoga or whether it's dance or whether it's um animal movements or uh, natural movements or the tons of them i think just just pick something to ensure what you like and just do follow on and just keep doing it i think um i think there's a lot of time um, you can you watching something or if listening to something just get up and move and um just focus on ensuring that um you're not sitting and there's enough uh, research which actually says that uh, sitting and uh, uh, lying down is the is is as bad as smoking so i think uh, i think it's very important to f- make the choice to get up and move and do things on the move and um 
and for all elders also who are watching, uh, parents who are watching, uh, sometimes it gets boring for us to do physical exercise without a target. So I think just have a target. If you're doing one push-up, just make it two. If you're doing sit-ups, five, do ten. If you're running one kilometer, either you run faster or you're longer. I think each one of us at whatever stage we are in our career should try to have a measurable goal of fitness, so which actually motivates. If you're doing yoga asanas, try to do them better. Um, any of those, because uh, we need targets and uh, to push us. And I think each one of our journey is very individual to our own self. We don't need to compare because we are born differently with different abilities. And we are at a different stage, each of us. Some of us, um, as, as women, maybe gone through childbirth and, and there are challenges. Somebody has a surgery and he has a challenges. Somebody is at zero, goes very fast, but after a while has an ankle sprain and goes down. But I think the journey has to continue. And that would be very, very important. Thank you. The next question is, uh, can you please share the different strategies of playing badminton? That would be very, very specific and individualistic. Um, but I think um, the strategy should be that um, I had a coach um, who would say this. I would say, put everything, take everything what your opponent hits at you, don't hit out, take the first point and keep the lead. I think that's a sure shot strategy to win. <laughs> but strategies are specific to where you are and what kind of an opponent you have. But the important thing is that um, break down your game into components of strength, endurance, speed, power, um, technical and tactical ability and try and improve on each of those boxes even by a little bit that is a sure shot success mantra or something which you will keep on improving this now both the health the health is not okay thank you the next question is what drives you at each moment Um, it's, it's, it's um, something, if somebody tells you good things, you take it as motivation. If them tells you not so nice things, you take it as a challenge. Um, you ignore people. Whatever you get, you try and figure a way out to change it into a strategy to keep pushing yourself to work hard. And um, for me, sometimes when I really feel low, um, I think some decisions and some effort is done because you need to do it for the country. And that gives me a lot of um, satisfaction because um, luckily for me, um, I've had a lot of issues with, um, with playing, with the coaching, uh, with the academy, but thanks to... Uh, God and Guruji's grace that whenever I've had issues, problems, I always had somebody who came out and out of the blue to support me. So uh, for me, uh, it's been a dream journey. Um, what I can do in a place where I am, um, not many people uh, are there. So if I can be of benefit, uh, in promoting sport, in promoting badminton, physical literacy. Uh, I think that's what I would be. But um, it's been a great journey. So it's not that I'm, um, uh, I need motivation or something. I'm just happy doing this. It's not that uh, motivation, sacrifice, hard work. It is not like, I like doing this. I love doing this and, uh, um, and I enjoy doing this. And that's why I do it. Thank you. The next question is, what is your personal take on the game as a player and as a coach? 
which practices help you to perform your best potential as a coach compared to when you were a player i think each of these depends on where you are and who you're coaching and what your opposition is so that's where i come back so all badminton is related to um to uh, to which what level you are so if you're a younger there's something called the long term athlete development and um it's a it's a scientific process um on at what times you should train the kid in what areas and that is something which should be used as a, a scientific input to say if you're 10 years old this is what you should do if you're 12 and 14 this is what you should do um but all um strategies specifics are related to very individual uh, things about uh, players thank you uh, the next question is how important is to find out sports talent in early ages um again it's it's um the best kids in the sense i you can't design and say that i want to become a sports person like this like this like this. you can't do that i think it's very important that at a young age you have an active childhood you you learn how to enjoy sport and you should play multiple sports to ensure that your mental faculties and your physical development is to the optimum and then choose sport as per their interest and expertise and body type uh, so if you are a gymnast you probably have early specialization if you are a rower you would have late specialization so you games which have skill as a predominant factor you need to spend more time early in life sports which have strength and power as their um, main components you need to give them as late development sports so these are different things so uh, to actually be able to explain this as a generalized strategy would be difficult but to be safe and to be um, to have the maximum development it is good if kids do things which involves running catching throwing jumping kicking sliding diving all of these things in various forms whether it's uh, in in on ground in the air or in uh, the water i think all of these ensures that they are developed fully and then they can do as per their interest and uh, opportunity and also their uh, um physical type body type because if you want to become a basketball player you can have the greatest of interest but you sh- also have to realize that the best players in the world are 6 feet 5 and 6 foot 6 so i think do you really have that or um, so if you so so that is also important to decide whether uh, you whether you should take that sport professionally or not Uh, thank you the next question is just before a new match uh, how would you inspire a newcomer how would you inspire a newcomer um different again different strategies i think if you have somebody who is intense many of the times we need to realize one fact that every kid wants to win every player wants to win there's no doubt about it who doesn't love success adulation victory but i think it's very important that we need to tell them good things so ignore sorry focus on the positive and ignore the mistake is one thing which i would follow and um, if kids are too intense then we would do something like um a fun game just before the match so that they loosen up and just tell only one or two positive points before the match and let them be rather than actually a whole lot 
which is difficult. So for a newcomer, I think uh, just go out there, give it all you have. But if you get an opportunity, grab it with both hands is what I would say. Beautiful. Uh, thank you. The next uh, question is, uh, my son, 14 years old, is a district level football player. Uh, he is so passionate that he keeps playing most of the day, but I don't know whether it's good for his future to keep playing all the time or he needs to restrict his play time so that injuries will be minimal. What's your take on this is what the parent is asking. I think um, use, use his interest in sport to do something very good for himself but also ensure that he does decently well in academics. I think um, you can put those caveats so that he also is studying well. Um, and also, if he has to play, and my mom's strategy was the best. Um, if you study and if you get ranks within the top 20, you can play. And uh, beyond that, then I will cut your badminton. So it's like, I whatever I could accept, but not, no badminton was not acceptable to me. So I had to kind of deal with that. Um, so I think uh, just put a benchmark of uh, where, but one thing is certain that he will only benefit from playing. And even if he plays professional or not, he will become very good because sport teaches you so much that um, you will not go wrong in sport. I think just ensure that be realistic. Uh, you be realistic. He need not be realistic. But uh, encourage him, let him do. At, at a certain point in life, um, when it's not, when he might realize that professional sport is not for him, in case it is not. If it is, then it's the greatest thing which you can have. But if it is not, he will realize and he will transform to another field but the learnings of sport will never go away from him for life so i think um, don't stop his dream because then they will have bitterness um, their entire life so i think use the dream to form a safety net around so that even if he doesn't because the reality is 99 percent of people who play sport don't really make it to that level so i think the percentages are not great but everybody is benefits from sport. And if you take out medals, then everybody is successful in sport. So I think look at sport beyond medals. As well. All life, ethics, science, let them publish papers. You know, about the genetic revolution and all those big things. And Sorry, I couldn't hear that question. No, no, it's okay. So the next question is, uh, sir, what are your tips for remaining persistent in what you do? I think love what you do. <laughs> Great. Thanks a lot. And the next question is, what do you think is the role of women in sports and also in uh, other, or other occupations? But I think generally what the question means is, what is the role of women, particularly in sports? They're a, you. Key. they're a key if, if, if the son or daughter wants to play also the mother is the key um, and uh, if they want to play also she is the key but I think um, I think as a society as a school I think we need to start um, encouraging women to take sport more and more um, and um, the only method is to encourage them and to give positive feedback and um, um, and they should feel safe about playing sport. I think these things are very, very important. So um, I think like in many or any other field, I think women are critical. And um, I think uh, if they have the talent, I think we should push them because there's a lot of opportunity for women also in sport because the numbers are very, very less, whether it's playing, coaching, administration, um, even referee, umpires, uh, policy making. There's a lot of need for women to actually come into sport in a big way. So I see opportunity also in sport. 
next question is which is your favorite and the best indoor coat uh the badminton coat <laughs> i would go with that answer because um i think when you win you get biased about certain stadiums and stuff but uh, for me i i think um i i think when you don't get to play and when you get to play that becomes the best so i think in that sense uh, it is um but um i think uh, i will have many answers for this uh, i remember how people asked me which is your favorite win uh, in terms of pure happiness that the matches or the school tournament which i won when i was in school compared to every other tournament in my entire career is the happiest moment so so i think some answers you give for press with later in life but really in terms of true happiness i think what i won for my school and the school gave a holiday the next day because we won i think that feeling is only different and in terms of your happiness those are the moments that is a brilliant answer thanks a lot the next question is, is they want some tips from you on how to overcome fear and weakness i think fear the simple uh, thing for me is what you are afraid of do it first go head on and face it don't wait for it in certain in any sense i think the the fear um, of failure the fear of the thing which you are afraid of is more uh, a problem in the mind than in actual reality so if you don't like something if you if you are afraid of something just do it first and uh, i think that's the best way to overcome fear next question is how would you define a successful person i no regret of the past no anxiety about the future and perfectly comfortable and happy with the present thanks uh, the next question is my 9 year old son dreams of becoming a badminton player it's a long unpredictable journey how to access uh, his progress uh, from time to time to make sure that he is on the right path Uh, can you please guide with general performance benchmark uh, to act, uh, to probably judge at different age levels what he is achieving is right or not yeah i think a very badminton specific question um the first thing is skill do you have as a kid the skill um the hand movement then the leg movement are the legs quick enough then when you start growing then when you start playing games then do you have the um the intelligence to figure out where the gaps are on the court because it happens so quickly that you need to be smart to recognize those things and then when you start growing further up and older then it almost is emotionally how strong you are and how you can close matches and travel uh for c- continuously and being alone continuously these are the things which you start looking at each stage in your career having said this kids grow at different times and two kids of the same age um are not in a physical and a mental side of the same age so they can have varying ages in development so to judge two 9 year olds without knowing little more about this aspect would be doing injustice to them so i think um it should just be a lot more patient as a 9 year old mother um just make him play a lot so that the skill is developed but also do other things so that his all round development is happening well thanks Uh, the next question is does sport help in spiritual advancement 
I think it does. I think mind body connect it does. Understanding yourself it does. To get away from failure and success it does. It teaches a lot. I think um, um, discipline it does. I think in every aspect. I think uh, sport is same like spirituality, and um, it's like you just need to pause a little bit and reflect and think about it. But uh, I do believe that awareness of body, awareness of your thoughts, your um, reflection of what's happened. Uh, I think all of these things come through sport very naturally. And as kids, I think whether it's lessons in values or whether it's lessons about life, I think can be taught much more effortlessly by sport than anything else. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, dear sir, how much time do you contribute from your day towards your passion? And uh, during this pandemic, has any new passion been included in your routine? I, I found um, I found a lot of time to spend with myself. So um, I've definitely gone physically fitter than what I've been. I also have time to do a lot more breathing and meditation and stuff. And uh, I also have time to spend with my family. Um, because of no travel. Uh, so I've actually enjoyed each day of the uh, lockdown. Um, and um, for me, um, it's it's been a time to reflect and uh, think back, but uh, overall it's been good. Uh, I, I would say uh, I've actually enjoyed the lockdown. I can't complain about it. Uh, great. Really? So Good to hear this, you know, wonderful hearing. And so uh, beautifully you have answered to every question raised from the students, from the parents, uh, so patiently and so brilliant that uh, we all could learn so much from each question that was raised with your responses. Really, thank you. And thank gratitude you is what I can really express at this moment. Really great. I have one personal question that I'd like to ask you, that each time you have um, had so many injuries, what was the mental frame and how did you bounce back during these times? Uh, because uh, it's not easy. Even in academics, we see that you know they go through some downfall or there's something that's, um, at home front that's not going right for them. So how did you counsel yourself and bounce back? I think I was much more raw at that time when you're 18, 19 years, when you are the best player in the country, when you have a future, uh, you think um, you are going to be successful and suddenly something which comes up, which actually hits you very hard. So for me, I was very fortunate that I had parents, mom and dad soaked in so much of pressure themselves. Um, also for me, there are a lot of people who supported me, but a lot of people who put me down very, very well, very strongly. So for me, each of those became a challenge. Each of my supporters became a strength, but I was smart or dumb enough to kind of somehow figure a way to turning these things around. Um, so if somebody said, you can't do it, then I would want to say that I will do it. And I'll show with my racket that I will do it. And if somebody who will say, you will do it, I was happy and I would say, yeah, I will do it. So you need to figure out a strategy to work. Sometimes in an uphill task, when you're the first to do, because today when you look at badminton, you're looking at a scenario where people have achieved, five, six people have achieved something. Back then, Prakasso was 1980. But by 91, 92, people had, at least we who were playing, had forgotten or thought that we could emulate him. So we were new. 95, 96, when I got the injuries, I was the only one who was going up. When you are that person who is first on that path, 
it is important you can say to be unrealistic or dumb or you you should not use your mental faculties so much you have to just go ahead and do it and if i and my challenge was that every time i jumped I, there was somebody in the crowd who would say ye aap girega and i would go out and when i was in training people would say iska to gutna do surgery hua hai ye teesra gaya abhi to nahi uthega ye and for me i would just take out one more the right leg out and say i'll jump on my left leg and i would see and i had a doctor who said that if you get us another fall you come back and do another surgery you are not giving up so that is what the attitude was to just go head on and face the fear rather than go away and hide from the fear and that is what really helped and i was rejoicing the fact that i couldn't walk for four months the fifth one i was walking with a limp the sixth month i would walk without a limp the eighth month i started to play i would started to run the ninth month i started to play just those small successes i was rejoicing and i also ensured that people around me or my mom ensured that the people around me the immediate few were always very positive and that really helped wow so much of positivity to learn from you with the positive attitude the mindset so positive wonderful listening to this and definitely so much to learn and take home from this truly grateful to you and you. really much to the same answer that you have said and if sharing your entire journey was so touching and inspiring no words Thank as you. i said only gratitude i now request mamta ji who is the principal of our ssrvm bangalore north to take it forward and thank you for being with us on this national sports day thank you so much gopi chand ji thank you truly thank you thank you very much jai gurudev yeah it's my privilege to propose the vote of thanks and also sum it up and um, wind up the talk so it's it's not just coincidence that on this day of uh, national uh, sports day we have the sports icon himself uh, pulella gopichand ji addressing uh, the students and the parents and the teachers of uh, shri shri ravi shankar vidya mandir you know like pulella gopichand the name itself is enough to you know it's still a lot of emotions and pride in each one of us uh, you know i should really say that you are a great blend of simplicity serenity physical fitness wisdom and values it was too good listening to you and uh, you know like you made us experience uh, the life of a sportsman through your talk which just came right from your heart it was so beautiful to just listen to you and like as i said it all was like we were experiencing uh, your life so it's been a great inspiration to everybody and you started with uh, you know the alphabetic uh, literacy and numeracy and then you very beautifully connected it to the physical literacy so this is something that we had never thought of and uh, uh, i mean your uh, I mean beautiful message to all that physical literacy is not just for sports aspirants or sports persons but it is for all that was a beautiful takeaway that each one of us have got uh, from this particular session of yours and uh, the analogy that you drew between the aptitude needed for scholastics and the at, at and the aptitude needed for sports was an eye opener for all parents and educationists and uh, students themselves and the significance and importance of sports as a way of life and as a path to physical fitness and physical literacy was um, really amazing and uh, your coinage sports for all and uh, was it another eye opener and uh, you beautifully very beautifully put it you know let's say everybody thinks of uh, learning sports only by going to coaching classes and things like that and 
coaching institutes but the way you said you know sports comes very very naturally to human beings so we learn sports more than uh, observing emulating and imitating um, that is beautiful and you know the um, sport is not just for a medal or a select few it is to help each student blossom to his or her fullest physical ability that was amazing and investing in sports what you said is uh, another great takeaway for us and uh, uh, i mean you have been a great example of resilience and endurance for all the sports um, aspirants and for physical literacy which is the need of the hour i should say and uh, another great thing that uh, wonderful thing that you said is uh, the process itself is a goal if you look at the process as a goal then goal takes care of itself and the simple uh, tip on diets like fruits vegetables uh, milk sleep sunlight and good thoughts so it's a great uh, combination and uh, which can never ever go wrong and uh, letting go of both failure and success as well and focus on the process again is such a beautiful thing that you said and being realistic is very important for the parents of sports aspirants and suppressing their dreams will lead to a lot of bitterness so this bitterness could lead into so many other things in the future so uh, as uh, parents and educationists again being with the dreams and ensuring and going to that last bit to ensure that the dreams of the students somewhere if if whether it, it it's realized or not that again it's left to destiny but being with them in that journey as you said the process is so important and uh, your experience of bouncing back from injuries and surgeries again is a great inspiration and learning for all of us so thank you so much uh, thank you jyanti it's been amazing listening to you and i uh, thank reshma ji and ssr vm trust for having organized uh, uh, you know i i i should not just call it a session or a talk and we have become a part of your journey and your experience and we are richer all those of us who have been with you for the past one of one and a half hours today have become much much richer in experience and there has been a big shift in our thought process so thank you so much uh, thank thanks you. to our uh, trustee and uh, chairman harsha ji Uh, our uh, head of academics ramaka and all the academic council members and thank you so much jai gurudev jai gurudev thank you jai gurudev thank you thank you very much